I'm Boaz. Uh, I'll be talking about some practical aspects of managing large distributed databases. Uh, if you haven't built a distributed database, which I think is most people, uh, you might not know what goes into uh, making that database correct. And if you've never operated a big database at scale, it might be interesting to see what uh, some of the complexities are um, when you get to many thousands of nodes. Uh, I'll talk about it in the context of what we built at Twitter on our internal key value store, Manhattan, to make cluster management super easy. Um, so my name is Boaz, and today I'm going to talk to you about managing database services. Um, if you operate the services that you build in production, you've probably learned a universal truth, and that's that operations are a burden on your team. The time that you spend managing your clusters is time that you're just treading water. You're not improving your services, uh, and you're not building new ones. In the six years that I spent at Twitter building and operating distributed storage systems with thousands of nodes, I've definitely seen and done my fair share of operations. Um, so what I want to talk to you about today um, is what makes operating distributed storage hard. Why you need to think about availability during routine operations. How you can maintain correctness as your clusters expand and contract and you move data around. And what starts to break down as your scale will continue to grow. I could talk about these in generalities, of course, but I think it'll be more interesting and more concrete to talk about them in the context of the problems and solutions um, that we have built at Twitter in our internal distributed storage system called Manhattan. If you haven't heard of Manhattan, it is the primary storage service at Twitter. Um, much like Cassandra or Scylla, at its core, it's a distributed, eventually consistent, Dynamo-style, last right wins key value store. Um, it also has a bunch of other properties that we thought was, would be really important for storage systems in general and inside of Twitter. Um, not so long ago, this database didn't really exist. Uh, today, it holds most of the data that powers Twitter. Tweets, DMs, users, advertising, anti-spam, on and on. And I think it's a bit unique for this particular discussion because it runs in three different modes of operation. An eventually consistent mode that you'll be familiar with, a strongly consistent mode, and a read-only mode. Um, because of this, I think as I describe what we did, you'll be able to find parallels between what we did and not just uh, you running Scylla or your other storage clusters, but you running any of your stateful services at your company. So first, let's start off easy. What does cluster management have to do with availability? I think you'll agree that the point of a stateful service is that any given piece of data exists on only a subset of hosts. Some databases, like HBase or Sharded Mongo, elect a master among these hosts. Manhattan, like a Cassandra or a Scylla, uses a quorum system which makes all the nodes equal and requires a majority of them to be up in order for data to be available. For normal operations, like when you want to restart nodes, that's fine. You don't lose any availability. But if a node is down because it's also restarting or it had a hard failure, restart, uh, restarting another node that it shares data with can cause your data to become unavailable. In order for us to make these restarts safe, we use, of course, a topology, a description of how the cluster distributes data and which nodes share data with other nodes. This could be like your ring information. Um, in this case, it's really simple. Data is shared among groups of three hosts. Uh, we can use that information to pick safe sets of nodes that can be restarted together um, and pick nodes that don't have any don't share data with any nodes that are down. We can do this manually, of course, by choosing batches, waiting for the host to restart, and when they come up, choosing the next batch and starting it again. And probably, when you first build your stateful service, you will do it manually. Um, but eventually, you're going to want to codify these rules into tooling to do it for you. Of course, if you're building a tool, the first step is to pick a cute name for it. Uh, our tool is called Manifest. And we make one command that does what a person would otherwise have to do, drive the restarts, make sure they happen safely, um, so that we don't have to think about it. This context, or this, uh, this pattern of taking actions that a human does and moving them into tooling is very necessary. And you're going to see it come up as I talk about more complicated topics. So 
I would say that the real meat of managing a storage cluster is ensuring correctness. It's one of the hardest things that you're going to have to get right if you're building your own systems. Let's say you're in a state where you're talking to the cluster and you know where the data is, um, and then you want to add some nodes. Necessarily, for those nodes to be useful, you have to move data to them, and then you have to move requests to follow that data around. If you ever end up in a state where requests are being sent somewhere that the data does not exist yet, even if that only happens for a moment, you've likely broken your contract with your customers and your database is not correct. So that's what I mean by ensuring correctness, at least in this context. Um, this is really hard to actually do in all cases. Uh, it's the reason why you'll see so many new stateful services that come up uh, and they can't be resized dynamically and in order to make a bigger cluster you have to set up a parallel one and take a planned outage. Um, and uh, you'll have to do a lot of work to make that work correctly. To talk about moving data though, we first have to talk about placing data. Um, Manhattan, like some other databases, unlike a database like Scylla, distributes, distributes its data by first partitioning the data into a set of shards. You can th think of a shard as like a preset slice of the possible key space. Um, we then distribute those shards among the nodes. There's a few ways to do this. One that you're probably familiar with is consistent hashing, uh, where you place the nodes, maybe as many virtual nodes on a consistent hash ring, uh, randomly, probabilistically, and then you place uh, other uh, the shards onto that ring to assign them to those hosts. Um, this worked for us, it worked for us for a long time, but because we are distributing shards uh, and not individual tokens, um, it turns out that uh, as your number of nodes starts to approach your number of shards, that probabilistic distribution doesn't become good enough, just like when you flip a coin, um, if you don't do it enough times, it won't look like a 50-50 chance. Um, so, as we scaled, our heaviest loaded nodes began to be much more full than our lightest loaded nodes. And we decided to take on uh, a different approach by adding a little bit of extra complexity and maintaining a static mapping between our shards and our hosts. So we gave our tools the ability to distribute the shards explicitly uh, and understand what needs to move whenever we move data around. Uh, we maintain that mapping, we back it up so that we don't lose it, and in exchange for some added complexity in our tooling and our processes, we get this perfect balance of data across the cluster. After placing data, now we were able to think about moving it around. Different services with different guarantees, obviously we'll do this a little bit differently. Um, Manhattan, as an eventually consistent store with last right wins conflict resolution, um, it does it in a way that you might be familiar with. Um, in, in this kind of database, there's a few basic steps that you have to go through, and we can model those steps in terms of explicit states that the cluster is driven through uh, in unison. Each node will have to acknowledge each state before we can move the cluster onto the next one. So here the states for moving data around look something like this. We start in a normal state, everything is fine, nothing is moving around. Um, when there's a new host, a new set of hosts that you want to add and you want to move data to, you direct writes uh, on the shard that you're moving to both the old set and the new set of hosts, and you wait for them to be applied on both sets of hosts before acknowledging to the client. Um, with this, waiting for two sets of hosts, will statistically impact your high percentile latencies, and it does technically open you up to slightly higher chances of unavailability, but it's of course a necessary trade-off for this correctness guarantee. Once we're done writing all rights to both places, we can take a snapshot, or once we've started directing all rights to both places, we can take a snapshot of the data from the old hosts and stream it over to the new ones. Um, remember the reason we can apply ongoing writes um, and backfill old writes is because we have that nice conflict resolution property where we know who the winner is going to be for any piece of data. And once we're done streaming, finally we can direct all of our reads and writes just to the new set of hosts and we're in a new normal state. So these are the basic steps when you think about them, but it turns out that they're not sufficient. And the reason that they're not sufficient is because we're running in a large distributed database and nodes in the database cannot change their state atomically together from one state to the next. 
Um, imagine you're keeping your, set, your uh, canonical store of what state you're in uh, in a central authority like a zookeeper. When you update that piece of data to say we're going to the next state, each node is going to receive that information at a slightly different time. Um, and you might end up into a situation where you're sending requests to a place where data doesn't exist yet or doesn't exist anymore. So for instance, while we're in some nodes, uh, while some nodes are in this final state, directing all their values, uh, all their writes and their reads to only one of the new set of hosts, um, other nodes might still be in the previous state, directing their reads to the old set. Um, that puts us uh, into a situation where a write um, that succeeds might not be visible to a subsequent read, and that violates our correctness. But because we know that each node is acknowledging every state, um, we have an extra piece of information, and that's that any node can only be in one of two states, the authoritative state and the one immediately preceding it. And we can use that information by introducing new barrier states into our topology transition to take into account the fact uh, that we're running in a distributed system. So in this example, what we add was uh, one state to prepare hosts to receive writes. We do this for two reasons. The first is a bit of a Manhattan implementation detail where every shard has its own physical backend and we need to instantiate that backend before it accepts writes. But really for any database, uh, you probably don't want your hosts to be able to passively receive writes uh, for data that they don't think that they should own. And so this step allows the node to prepare itself to say, I own new data now. Um, and we had another state to correct the issue that I talked about. We direct reads to the new hosts before we stop writing to the old ones. Because we know that we can only be in the current state or the one immediately preceding it, we know that by the time we want to stop writing to the old hosts, all the reads are already going to the new ones. And with that, we have a series of states uh, that we can drive our cluster through to have a safe topology transition in all circumstances. So now that we have this, how do our operators actually create, run, drive a cluster transition? We go back to our operations tool and we give it the ability to check out the current topology of the cluster. We can then modify that topology um, to do what we want, like add nodes, and then we execute our topology transition and allow the tool to drive the cluster through all the appropriate states. The nodes in the, in the cluster know what the new topology is and what the old topology was, and as they're driven through the states, they change their behavior to match uh, the appropriate actions. So that's pretty simple. We can make it even more exciting. I mentioned that Manhattan has multiple modes of operation. One of them is a strongly consistent mode. Uh, the way that we ensure strong consistency in a nutshell, although I do have a whole other talk talking about that, um, is that messages that belong to a shard are delivered to, to that shard through a sequential log. Nodes that own the shard subscribe to that log, uh, and when they apply the action, they return the response back to the writer, which in Manhattan's case is a coordinator node. Because the order of operations uh, is guaranteed as they enter the backend, Operations are linearizable at the shard level, or more usefully, at the object level. And this also means that, unlike an eventual consistency, we no longer have the benefit of this conflict resolution property that we had before, right? Um, so we need to strictly control the order uh, that operations are entering the back end. Let's look at what happens when we try to apply our existing state machine to this kind of cluster. You'll notice two interesting things. First, we reach this state where we would have been directing writes to both sets of hosts. However, this doesn't quite make sense now. Um, because we need to control the order that operations enter the shard, and we don't have all of the old operations in the shard yet. Um, because we don't have any data um, and the order matters, we can't consume anything from the log, and because we can't consume from the log, we can't actually acknowledge those writes back. The state doesn't really make sense, and so we make it a no-op in our state transition. And we move on. The second thing you'll notice is after we have streamed data from the old host to the new ones, and we're able to start applying writes from the log, we get to the state where we want to direct reads to the new set of hosts. This is where it gets tricky because this is okay if your reads are also strongly consistent reads, reads that are going through the log. 
Um, however, if you want to, like many databases, direct what we call eventually consistent reads that are faster and cheaper to these hosts that have strongly consistent data written to them, we can get into a situation where we don't know for sure that the rights that were previously acknowledged on the old set of hosts also exist on the new set. And again, we might serve incorrect, in this case, stale data. So what do we do? We add new barrier states. The first state we add is a replacement for the one that we skipped earlier. Um, our cluster has streamed the data. It's able to apply um, operations from the log. And so now we can wait for the new set of hosts to apply and acknowledge sequential operations um, in order for us uh, to make progress. At this point, we know that all new writes that are entering the database are coherent on the storage nodes to our satisfaction, right? We then add a second state that again ensures that we're caught up so that we know that we've processed any leftover writes that were in the log that didn't previously need an acknowledgement from both sets of hosts. Only after this point are we safe to start directing reads to the new host set. And with these changes, we now have another uh, topology state machine that allows us to safely transition a strongly consistent Manhattan cluster. Now you'll notice though that these two new states that we added are not useful for eventual consistency because we already had a safe state machine before. So like strong consistency treats one of these states as a no-op, eventual will treat these two new states as a no-op. By making our state machine a superset of the safe states that a cluster has to go through, we're able to reuse the same state machine and importantly, therefore, the same code on different services that have significant operational differences. This is obvious with an extreme example. Manhattan's third mode of operation is read-only. Read-only um, is very simple. As advertised, there's no online write path. Fully sharded data sets are generated in HDFS and downloaded into the cluster to be served whenever they're available. To move a shard, you simply go from a normal state to a streaming state where you're downloading the data uh, from HDFS into the node and then to uh, a state where you direct reads to the new set of hosts. The majority of the states uh, on the state machine in this case are no ops. But again, because of that, we can reuse our logic and also reuse our tooling. So with no changes whatsoever, we can use the exact same tool to control the topology of three different architectures of a database. We check out the topology from Zookeeper, we edit it the way that we want to, and we execute the transition. Now, that's easy, but you'll see that I'm being honest here uh, in telling you that we would run this transition in a screen session, although some of our team members would prefer Tmux. Um, that's because the transition, um, which listens for acknowledgments, uh, and from Zookeeper, updates the authoritative state, waits for all the hosts, was driven by the tool. And it turns out that for large transitions that move many terabytes of data around, that can take a really long time. And that leads us kind of into our next topic. Uh, I talked about maintaining availability with the example of safe restarts. And we talked about ensuring correctness, uh, what goes into that when you're moving data around. These two properties are fundamental properties of your service, and you have to maintain them and make sure that they work correctly in order to not let your customers down. But the operational scale of your service, yes, the number of nodes in the service, but also the number of people who are working on managing those nodes, is a complicating factor in any service that you run and in stable services in particular. That's because when your cluster is small, life is good, everything is easy, the space of possible things that can happen is also small. Maybe a node will die on occasion, you find it and remove it. Uh, you, when you're going to replace it, if someone asks you to add capacity to the cluster, you can say, just give me a minute to get the cluster back into a healthy state. Uh, it doesn't take too long because you don't have too much data. And now you have a clean slate to add your nodes, in, nodes into. Because your scale is small, it's easy for a person to reason about what's going on and in what order things should happen. And they know how long any action can take. So while there's some effort, that effort is low, and so you can, and in practice, you will tolerate inefficiencies in your process and in your tooling. But when you reach a larger scale, 
The primary issue is that many more things are happening at once. A large cluster is going to have multiple simultaneous node failures. It's up to the operator, operator to decide where are these failures happening. Can I resolve them all at once, or should I do it in parts? How do I react quickly enough to limit my risk of unavailability? Meanwhile, it's not just your cluster that's grown, it's also your team. And one of your engineers wants to deploy a new version of the database and roll a cluster. Does the rolling restart impact the down nodes, or vice versa? Does it change how many nodes are safe to remove at once because you're doing more operations? Does the person executing the restart know that it's going to take longer because they have to wait on nodes that are down? And should they be constantly checking back to know when it's complete? And then as you start making progress removing the nodes, someone comes in with an urgent need to expand the cluster. So now, how do these ongoing operations interact? Do you pause the removing nodes while you add new ones? Uh, if you're in the middle of a removing node, uh, do you cancel that operation and, and take the ask instead? And of course, while you're working on all these things, hardware is going to do what it likes to do, which is fail. Nodes in your existing cluster will fail. Nodes that you're restarting will fail and not come back from restart. Nodes that you're adding to the cluster will fail as they're being streamed in. If a node that you're adding fails, do you kill the whole transition and start over? What if that already took a bunch of hours because you have a lot of data? How many nodes do you have to do maintenance on before you can finally stop worrying about this rolling restart? There's just a lot for a person to think about. And as I said, the time that you're spending thinking about managing your cluster is time that you're just treading water, you're not working to improve your service. So what we wanted to do was to take away the need to constantly think about cluster management from our team and make our service think about it for us. We followed three simple rules to accomplish this. First, and most importantly, operations should always be safe to execute. If an operator wants to do something to a cluster, they should never worry about whether that action is going to break your service. Um, if it could, we either don't let them do it or we put it off until a later time when it's safe. Second, we want to make operations fire and forget. Sitting around, babysitting cluster operations, constantly checking back to see if they've completed, worrying about how to resume them properly if they fail or if our tooling dies. It was one of the most wasteful things that we were doing, and we didn't want to do it anymore. And finally, we want to continue to minimize the need for operators to have domain knowledge about their service. This goes back to what I said about topology transitions earlier, where the same steps were followed regardless of the type of Manhattan cluster. If we can make all operations simple enough that we, they just describe what we're doing and not how they need to happen, regardless of how a cluster works, operators can have much more effect with much less thought. So we accomplished these goals um, by taking all of the logic that a person would normally do and codifying it once into an always-on cluster manager service. The cluster manager behaves uh, like, in a sense, a person would it keeps in its head a view of the state of the world, and it updates the state atomically in ZooKeeper so that we can run safely uh, with redundancy and protect against ongoing failures. When the cluster manager makes a change to the state, much like when we would do it with our command line tooling, it updates the topology in ZooKeeper and it drives the cluster transition. Nodes are subscribed to that state, and they change their behaviors accordingly. Of course, we had to give it a cute name, so we call it the Ops Genie. We built a few things into Ops Genie to make it meet our requirements. First, we gave it a goal-oriented architecture. This is as opposed to an operationally-oriented architecture. And we gave it all the rules that it needs in order to safely run concurrent operations on the cluster when those operations can be run concurrently. As I mentioned, the operation service keeps a state of the world. And when you ask it to execute operations, it doesn't say, OK, I need to do this, and then I need to do that. It instead updates its goal state of the world. These nodes should exist. These nodes should not exist. These nodes should be restarted after this time. It can then take safe actions in order to accomplish these goals. We also have it make incremental progress and continuously rebalance the cluster. So if I want to add a set of hosts to the cluster, it will select the shards uh, that belong on that host, and it will start to move them. If I then decide to add a different additional set of hosts with the old tooling, I may have had to stop the transition or cancel it or wait for it to complete. Now the Ops Genie just updates its goal state 
and on the fly, it changes its behavior to move the shards that belong in the latest set of hosts to the right place. This allows us to get to our goal state as fast as possible, regardless of how often we're changing it, and that turns out to be all the time. And, of course, we gave it the ability to manage our restarts and to detect when nodes are up or down. It consults the topology and the health of the nodes. It only asks nodes to restart if it's safe for them to do so. And if an operator asks to restart a cluster for whatever reason that's unsafe, um, the opportunity will just wait patiently until it, it sees in the future that it can finally achieve its goal state. There's no more babysitting. There's no more waiting around. And if anyone wants to see the progress, they can just check the graphs on our services metrics. Um, and finally, of course, as you would do for any service, the genie throttles the rate at which it completes operations. Restarts, shard movements, whatever you're doing, we need to make sure that we don't have an impact on the cluster by doing too many things at once. So with all of these features that we can do, how easy or hard do you think it is to now actually operate a Manhattan cluster in production? Well, here's our new client. If I now want to issue a rolling restart, like before, it's just genie client rolling restart. This command, however, returns instantly, and I don't have to think about the restart anymore. To handle the death of a node, we now simply mark it dead. The genie knows what checks to make to be sure that the node is really dead and not in a zombie or a half-dead state. And, it, and once that's verified, it knows the best way to deal with a dead node and to restore health back to the cluster. Adding nodes is also similar. There's no more editing topology files, which, as it turns out, gets pretty unwieldy when you enter the thousands of nodes territory. So now we simply uh, tell the service that we want to add these nodes. It takes care of the rest, again, with no babysitting. And as you might expect, if a node dies while we're in the middle of adding it, we just mark it dead and go about our day. And maybe most importantly, we have the ability to pause the service. You're always going to have some emergency where you'd like to stop any more actions from happening on your cluster. The ops genie has a simple freeze command that just says, stop trying to make progress against your goal state for now. This is really useful if you ever detect a bug during a deploy, or you think a transition is having an undue impact, that sort of thing. Now, you can see um, that it's easy for us to do all of these operations no matter what we think is happening on the cluster. So all these operations that you saw are extremely simple and really straightforward. Um, you can tell that they don't really have anything to do with, with storage clusters or with how a distributed database works. We're able to completely hide a how an operation happens, and operator, operators only need to worry about when those operations should happen. And once you've done that, it now becomes easier than ever to take the next step, the important step, and automate your operations. With the genie worrying about, for instance, how to remove a dead node from a cluster, it's easier than ever to just automate detection of dead nodes and hardware failures and tell the operations service to remove them. When we receive new machines added to a cluster, it's trivial for us to instruct the operations service to add them as soon as they're ready automating these common actions so that they take literally zero time from your human engineers, greatly frees up uh, your teammates so that they can use that time to improve your service and to deliver more value to your customers or whatever else they want to use that time for. So we have a great thing. We're always working to make it greater. We have a lot of interesting work ahead of us uh, that I don't have time to go into all of it now, um, things like better shard placement, um, shard splitting, more intelligent distribution uh, of data across the cluster based on use case and usage type um, for people who have point lookups versus range queries, people who want ordered data versus randomly hashed data. Um, there's lots of things that we are working on at Twitter, um, and at our scale, there's always more extremely fun problems to solve. But I do want to ask you, to go back to your teams, to look at your day-to-day -day work, to see where you're spending your time, and to ask yourself, where can you make your service think so that you don't have to? Thanks very much. <laughs>